Good afternoon, welcome to this Tuesday's edition of The Pulse here on Joy News. We are also live on all our social media platforms, and of course, you can join us on the Joy News channel here. And this afternoon, less than 24 hours to the 2024 budget presentation, the minority says government will seek to impose new taxes as it seeks to raise some 12 billion Ghana cities. I with help from Ghanaians tomorrow would have been to announce that he has reached an agreement with external creditors in order that he'll be able to save some 10.5 billion US dollars out of the 29 billion US dollars external. We are live in Parliament plus analysis of how this will impact you. Your insatiable crave for fufu and banku is putting pressure on the economy. The two mills contributed significantly to the inflation in the last month. But how? As the Seminovi to find out tomorrow, and students and schools in the contest have been showing off what they have got for you. We bring you all the exhibits ahead of tomorrow's finals. These and more here on the polls. My name is Elton Grobe. It's a pleasure to be with you. The pause is brought to you by Global Communities Digging Low, Affordable Safe Sanitation for All. We are live on DSTV on channel 421 Go, TV 125. Follow, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and myjoyonline.com for these and many more. We'll be back to, the, to deal with the matters before us. Welcome back to the pause here on Joy News. It's Tuesday. We have a lot coming your way ahead of the presentation of the 2024 budget. My name is Elton Brobe. Now we are starting from the house where preparations are underway for the presentation of the government budget and economic policy for the year 2024. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata has been engaging MPs on tomorrow's budget from which meetings the minority MPs say they have a hunch that Mr. Oforiata will be introducing fresh taxes when he presents the budget tomorrow. We are in Parliament, in studio, and out and about. In the studio now is Isaac Kofiaje, who is a data analyst here with the Joy Research Team. He's joining us for some analysis. Also here with us, we will have an economist and policy analyst, Peter Tepe, plus take you live to Parliament, uh, where correspondent Kweku Asante will be joining us. So we have uh, a bag full of issues relating to the 2024 budget that will be presented to the House tomorrow. Uh, along the line, we'll also be telling you about the inflation rate for the month of October, which is giving some boost to, you know, government economic, um, you know, issues ahead of the presentation. But, uh, Kofi, welcome mm -hmm. to the pause. Thank you. We have a lot to deal with this afternoon. Yeah. We'll be going to Parliament to gauge the mood ahead of the presentation for the first time. The finance minister met for the MPs from both sides mm. to sort of prepare their minds for what is to come tomorrow. We are told that, you know, from the minority's perspective, we should be looking at the finance minister hoping to generate some 12 billion Ghana cities. Where the finance minister is expecting to generate this money from is unclear, but their fear is that 
it may lead, it may lead to uh, the introduction of some fresh taxes yeah. or better still an enhancement to the existing one. But we'll get to understand it, yeah. uh, even though from our chest with the finance ministry, it is unclear that yeah, government will be introducing be. new taxes to, uh, in, the, in the 2024 budget tomorrow. So we'll go to parliament to uh, hear from the MPs uh, from the minority side who are raising the alarm bells ahead of representation tomorrow. We'll also be speaking to our parliamentary correspondent. But what are you getting from your own checks? Well, it's, it's interesting if you compare almost exactly a year ago in the 2023 budget, some of the things that we said we were going to do yeah. uh, to cut down on cost, uh, December 20, uh, November 2022, when we're going into Christmas, government said it was not going to do any hamper for Christmas. You remember that mm. there was a ban on, I think, V8 vehicles and a whole lot of others. But you spoke about government wanting to generate some 12 billion Ghana cities. At least that is what the minority is telling us this afternoon, that well, the meeting they had with the finance minister, it came up that government will be seeking to generate additional. some 12, additional 12 billion Ghana cities. We don't know how much government will be seeking parliament to approve so that they can spend in the 2024 mm -hmm. fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But an addition to whatever will be, what is on the table, is 12 billion Ghana yeah. cities. It's unclear how government Absolutely. is going to generate this, this Yesterday we had a discussion and I told you that the 2024 budget mm -hmm. will feature heavily on some of the elements in the IMF program. I told you that we are hoping that by the end of the IMF program, our tax to GDP ratio will move from somewhere 13% to about 16% at the end of the IMF program in 2026. And if you are going to do some of these things, it's either the already existing tax handles you have, you find ways and means to rebound them, to bring in more, to rake in more revenue, or you introduce new measures. I told you about yesterday, we discussed about some, I think four or three taxes that government was hoping that it will add about 1% to GDP. Even in the 2023 budget, if you look at some of the revisions and modification government did, like the income tax amendment bill, uh, which was is expected this year to bring in some 1.2 billion Ghana cities. Mm. We also have the excise duty amendment bill bringing in 400 million cities, and then also the growth sustainability amendment bill, some 2.2 billion Ghana cities. Mm. If you add these three tax handles, we were expecting some 4 billion cities in addition to taxes this year. And yesterday we had a discussion, and we said in 2023, for instance, that's the first time government expenditure actually crossed 200 billion Ghana cities versus you know, revenues and grants, you could see that there was a vast difference, a huge variance between the two, costing about over 60 billion deficit that government was looking at ways and means to actually, uh, you know, uh, finance this. In 2024, I'm sure that government is working on ways and means to shrink this huge deficit of over six, 60 billion uh, Ghana cities to maybe uh, a reasonable amount. But we do not know where some of these new tax handles and additional revenues will be coming from. But what we know is that government, we, government has a, a tax to actually accomplish by 2026 where we have to move our tax to GDP ratio from the current 14, 13% to somewhere around over 15% or 16% by the end of the year. But is this possible within the time frame that we have to do whatever we can mm -hmm. to move our tax to GDP from the current for 13% to 16%. 16, on paper, yeah. it may look, you know, very possible mm -hmm. to do it. But on the ground, do you, with what government uh, is implementing, mm -hmm. do you see some light at the end of the tunnel? Well, it's difficult to actually say government can achieve or cannot. Because if you look at one key component of the tax revenue, which is the e-levy, was supposed to bring in $7 billion in 2022, mm -hmm. failed to bring in that brought less than, I think, 500 million Ghana cities. Then in 2023, you are hoping to get some 800 million Ghana cities. And if you look at the, the provisional data provided by the finance ministry themselves, you could see that what we got in quarter one and quarter two, if you add the two, is probably nothing to write home about. It's way below the target. And so it's difficult seeing some of these tax handles already performing below the belt. Poorly. Exactly, but you also have the VAT that was increased from 12 to 15 
also helping to also push up the, the, the revenue to, to, to some, you know, appreciable level. Right. But, Let me hold you there. Yeah, okay. I'll come back because we have a lot to digest yeah, yeah. on the economy and, of course, the budget, 2024 budget that we are all expecting to hear uh, tomorrow when the finance minister, on behalf of the president, lay before the House the budget and government economic policy for the year 2024. But let me take you to Parliament because already the, the heat has already started in Parliament. The finance minister this morning met with uh, members of Parliament sort of to give them a heads up as to what this was expects in the presentation tomorrow. Uh, Koku Asante is our parliamentary correspondent. He's joining us via Zoom. Koku, good afternoon and welcome to the pause here on Joy News. All right, so we'll take you back to Parliament where parliamentary correspondent Koku Asante uh, will be joining us to give us an update on the meeting that was held today between the finance minister and members from both sides, the minority and the majority. Uh, you know, to, to, to sort of tell them what they should expect in tomorrow's presentation. Uh, former minority leader Haruna Idrisu, who is also a member of parliament for Tamil House, spoke after the meeting. We can listen to him and then we'll, we'll connect with Koko Asante. The kind of career that we have for Ghanaians tomorrow would have been to announce that he has reached an agreement with external creditors in order that he'll be able to save some 10.5 billion US dollars out of the 29 billion US dollars external debt. That will give him some fiscal space. So he's more likely to say that. I'm, I'm near conclusion <laughs> with external creditors, including China and Paris Club, on closure on this matter, which has become a requirement of the IMF for the release of the 600 million US dollars bailed out to add up to the initial 600 million US dollars, which was uh, released earlier. I think that we need the 600 million US dollars badly before the end of November. So, Daniel should expect uh, a review of uh, uh, the Now, we must also, as a country, all of us, including those of us in the NDC, must begin looking for answers as to how to deal with the continuous depreciation of the city. We need to work to expand exports. We need to work to preserve foreign exchange in this country. Many of you have not looked at their mathematics. I mean, if you took 3 million US dollars as a business in 2021, that was 18 million Ghana cities. Today, the same 3 million dollars is 30 million Ghana cities. Activity of project can give you profitability to uh, amortize this particular loan. So, like the state, if you are servicing 29 billion US dollars at an exchange rate of six cities to eight cities, it's now 12 uh, cities. What revenue measure can give you enough resources to contain this? This is the country's limits. Our economic nemesis is arresting the depletion of the city, not in Baumier's. So, Harun Idrisu, the member of parliament for Tamil South, and of course the former minority leader, uh, speaking after that meeting with the finance minister this morning. And clearly, uh, the, the battle lines have been drawn ahead of the presentation. We're likely to hear more of such after the presentation tomorrow. But back here in the studio, I still have Kofi uh, Ajay uh, from, our, from our research and data. And of course, uh, I also have in the studio here with me an economist and policy analyst, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Peter Tepe. You're welcome to the polls, of course. And of course, we'll be going back to Parliament as well. But uh, Kofi, you were, you, you, were, you were summing up on the taxes that we are likely to hear tomorrow. Yeah. So, it's not so clear in mm. governments will introduce more taxes. But what we do know in the IMF program is that some of the tax handles, just like I mentioned, the e-levy is supposed to go under some revision so that we can look at the optimization because it's been almost two years since it was introduced and we've hit below the belt in terms of all the targets for the 2022 fiscal year and then also uh, this uh, 2023 fiscal year. But the good news is that if you look at the revenue and grant aspects, it was indicated in the IMF program that we were likely to get some grants and we are budgetary support in the form of grants from the AFDB 
thankfully that low um, grant agreement has been actually signed and we are probably going to get some, more than $102 million, which is good news for government at the revenue side. It's going to help show up the budget and then also help not to put a lot of pressure on the city. You heard Harry and I so talking about exchange rate depreciation. Very, very important because Elton, if you're a student right now and you are hoping to go to the U.S. to study and you, you look at your attendance fee, how much you are going to spend throughout the year, let's say if it's around even $170,000, you should be looking at more than 2 million Ghana cities. Where are you going to get that money from? It's just because of exchange rate. Something that could cost you thousands now can cost you millions of Ghana cities. So my own checks, uh, I mean, suggest that these are some of the things that we are likely to hear tomorrow from sources at the, at the Ministry of Finance. Mm. Uh, expenditure rationalization measures, efforts to reduce inflation, further stabilize the city and address private sector concerns to boost investment, jobs, and growth. Mm. Uh, Mr. Tepe, I mean, we are all looking forward to tomorrow. Quite an important day. And we are going to hear the 2024 budget. In the absence of a clear-cut direction as to whether we're going to have the second tranche of the IMF money, the 600 million U.S. dollars. We understand that last week the African Development Bank made some advancement to Ghana, about $120 million to support our budget. In the absence of the IMF infusion, does it give cause for worry? Yeah, it, it, indeed, it gives cause for worry, but not to the level that we're, we're thinking. In fact, the IMF support um, has been over, overrated as if it's going to be the solution to our problems. Mm. If you look at the 2023 budget, total expenditure was about 205 billion cities. And if you look at it on a monthly basis, that 25 billion cities in terms of expenditure. Mm. And if you look at it on a monthly basis into dollar terms, it means that our monthly expenditure will be about $1.5 billion. Mm. And so if you look at $1.5 billion in terms of expenditure, compared to the revenue, which was $144 billion, which would be about $1 billion. If you look at the, the, the difference, which means we have about $500 million gap, and IMF is giving you $3 billion over a period. So which means that if you want to look at it from that perspective, even a year, if they give you, assuming we should even receive the $600 million, it means in total we'll have received $1.2 billion. Why you need $1.5 billion every month of spend? And so the IMF, I mean, support is actually just to, I mean, give us some, give us some confidence. Yes, give some confidence to the some policy credibility. Exactly, but not to solve our problems. That is why it's very important that government will have to introduce, I mean, uh, 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 other uh, innovative means of ways of expanding their revenue basket so that you have a lot of people, I mean, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, contributing to the, to the revenue base of the economy. Other than that, if you have your denominator, which is the uh, 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 GDP, I mean, not growing, and you have your debt increasing, then, of course, then there's a, there's a cause for worry. So what government should have focused on is to make sure that they expand the economy by making sure that the GDP, I mean, we, we expand the GDP. Then even if your debt is even increasing, of course, you'll be able to, I mean, still run the economy. Because in the, in, in the past years, government seems to be depending on tax, and that is, that is not a sustainable way of generating revenue because expenditure of government will continue to increase because government is not a private organization where they are aimed to make money. So most of the projects are not commercialized and you don't generate income. So you look at innovative ways of minimizing cost and at the same time maximizing revenue so that you can be able to handle the numerous demand for development projects. So the, what, what, what we are being told by the minority from the meeting they had with the finance minister is that the finance minister will be requesting an additional 12 billion Ghana cities to spend in 2024. Where do you think that money would come from? What else can we think of? If More taxes? Exactly. But that would be even disastrous because, you see, the, if you look at the GDP pattern, you realize that industry has been, I mean, uh, uh, going down in terms of the contribution to, to, to GDP, which means that we need to industrialize the economy more. Because when industries and the, when the, when the industry begin to grow, then, of course, you'll be able to generate some sizable number of, uh, amount of revenue. 
unfortunately, it, it appeared that the only key source of revenue for government is tax. Meanwhile, we have so many opportunities to, 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 to expand the revenue base by concentrating on the manufacturing sector, concentrating on the industry, so that we can be able to grow. You see, if you look at the uh, taxes that were introduced, like the sustainability, the, the growth and sustainability, yeah. for instance, already in the, uh, uh, organizations have been affected. Yeah. Initially, the vast that was introduced, 1.5, that is a get fund and the, and the, and the uh, health insurance uh, tax. Sure. They, were all, they were all part of the, the total VAT system where you can net off. That is where you use your uh, output to net off your input. Now it is a levy, so it has become a direct cost on the, uh, how do you call it, on all businesses. And we have a lot of gaps in the system. And so you see that most organizations are either doing redundancy or they are doing retrenchment because they cannot match their cost with their revenue anymore because the system is not friendly. So, 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 so therefore, it makes no sense to introduce more taxes At because the, the, the existing ones is already suffocating businesses. It's seriously suffocating businesses. And, uh, and government is very much aware because they have seen the deep in the, the contribution of industry to, the, to uh, our GDP. And that, that is where the problem is. And so if, if it is not friendly or the economy is not attractive to foreign investment, mm. then certainly what you are doing is that you are no more going to be, I mean, the preference for investors. And you're also not going, they are also going to think of, I mean, expanding their businesses or mm. increase. Because at the end of the day, when their businesses are growing, then of course, it comes with so many advantages so that there will be more employment. And then if you look at the value chain of some of the manufacturing businesses, the transport sector, and the service sector, the suppliers, a whole lot. So when one industry is down, when one organization is in one manufacturing company is down, mm. you can imagine. Look at how many uh, 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 casual workers, for instance, are engaged or factory workers are engaged when manufacturing sector is striving. All these people, they are all going. And it is a risk. It is a security issue for the economy. So what do you see as an economist? Is it a case that we lack creativity such that our only resort is to continue to tax and tax and tax? It, the issue is, is, is a mix. It's one, partly creativity and partly the over-ambitious nature of, um, of, of our leaders in mm. terms of what they want to do over a short period. Because the structure so, of, of our economy, we've been told since 1992, and successive government, they've all made a point that the structure of, a, of our economy must change. But it hasn't changed that much. Taxation has always been the resort. That's why I ask the question. Do we lack creativity in terms of diversifying the economic side that will be able to make it more attractive to businesses? Uh, at the start of the administration of this government, we were told that we were going to move from taxation to production. At least that taxation has become the main tool to generate revenue. Yes, so, so like I was saying, it's because of how ambitious, over ambitious leaders are in terms of what they want to do over a short period. Because taxes are the easier way, that's the easy way of generating revenue for you to do the, so many things that you want to do. And then going for loans. So if you look at it, this government was going for a lot of loans because they have a lot on a plate to deliver. And if you say you want to industrialize, they realize that it will take some time. You have a gestation period for you to put things in place to, before you start generating revenue. And they realize that, look, if we are not careful, by the time the returns start coming, our four years will be, will be over and people will not see what we have done. But that is what we need until we focus on that to say that, look, yes, Economy need to grow. We need to bring development. But let's let's look at the priority areas, such that we will slow down in terms of the popular programs or projects that will drain us more than we are generating. And if we don't do that, we will continue to have this 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 this, this, this problem. Because if you have capital intensive projects, and if you look at it, most of the manifestos of of, of these political parties, they don't have the sources of the revenue in order to, or in, in, in order to uh, 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 spend. 
and they come out with projects such that they focus on going for loans because that is the way they can be able to. However, you all know that government, like I said, is not a commercial organization that will generate income. So we need leaders that will not think of what they can do within their tenor, but what they can do that will benefit the nation, such that even when they are off, we still have the economy running. All right. I I'll come back to you for us to deal with some, I mean, relevant issues that we cannot avoid, especially now that uh, labor is discussing with governments, they are negotiating the base pay with government. The Ghana Medical Association, they've made it clear that by January 1, if their conditions of service um, is not implemented, they may take a staff stance against government. Clearly, these are things that are waiting to happen. But, mm -hmm. Kofi, are there benchmarks that we need to meet? I mean, now that we are under an IMF program with this budget that is, that, that is coming tomorrow. Well, of course, there are actually benchmarks that we have to meet. So if you look at the table that we have been referencing, which is actually in the IMF official document, if you look at the end June 2023 um, performance criteria, as for that one, I'm sure we've already met almost all those benchmarks. But another benchmark, which probably may not look like a benchmark, but it's a strong condition, is the condition that we have to meet in order to call the first review of the IMF program successfully completed, which is getting actual restructuring and agreements with our external creditors. We've not been able to do that. Now, away from that, we know just by doing that, it's supposed to free up some fiscal space for us to do some expenditure in 2024 and other years. But I'm looking at the summary sheet produced by the Bank of Ghana, and I see something very staggering on the sheet right now. If you look at our total exports, comparing 2022 fiscal year when we're actually not really doing well versus 2023 when we have an IMF program, there is some huge and significant drop in our total export between these two periods, so from January to August. In 2023, 2022, by this time, January to August, we had exported cocoa, um, oil, and then also gold worth um, $11.8 billion. Now, if you look at the same period in 2023, we are looking at 10 point, somewhere $10.8 billion. So if you half, net it, almost like half one, is gone. One billion, one billion is already is gone. gone. We've, we've lost that one billion, which is very, very key. Now, what could be contributing to this? Because it's, if you look at the data, it's actually stemming from the oil exports. Mm. We've not been able to get more oil export, exports compared to last year. Last year, around this same time, uh, we were doing oil exports around $3.8 billion. Currently, between, um, it's cumulative anyway, January and August, now we are doing 2.3. So if you net it, oil alone in that space, we've lost over a billion dollar there. And that's not good news for us mm. because this is the time that we need more, you know, forex, the dollars. Because already we have the 10.5 billion fiscal space or BOP to finance ourselves, which we have to negotiate with our creditors to give us that financial space. Mr. Takovic spoke about it. What you need is not what the IMF is giving. They are just giving you a portion of it. You also have a duty to play which is to organize your creditors, tell them to give you some magnitude of haircuts, get the assurances, free up some space for your own self so that you can spend. So that in 2024, you don't end up spending that close to $3 billion. You always spend on interest payment alone. Just imagine an economy and you are spending $3 billion every year on, on interest, interest payments payment alone. How are you going to survive? But there are also key things that we cannot avoid. For Absolutely. example, government... Is so negotiating with the independent power producers mm -hmm. to come to some decision. Yes. There's some one billion dollars that either must be paid or restructured. It's unclear how far they've gone with that matter. Well, <laughs> now, energy is key. Yeah. If you're unable to have sustainable energy in the country, mm -hmm. it affects industry and affects growth. There's also this the, the, the external creditors that we are negotiating with. Mm -hmm. There are things that must be done in 2024 yes. that you cannot avoid. Yes. So, Mr. Tepwe, I mean, looking into the budget. I earlier spoke about the demands by labor unions. There's a discussion on the base pay and the demands that they will, they will be making. We are also entering into an election year. 
What suggestion can you make as we look forward to the presentation? We need to look at our one, one suggestion is that let's look at our expenditure, total expenditure. Do a, conduct a, a total review on our expenditure. And let's look at those that we can defer. Mm. Like I indicated, there are a lot of ongoing projects that have stalled. And this, some of these projects are heavily capital intensive. And some have stalled because the sponsors have they, they've withdrawn their sponsors, meaning that it may not come back anytime soon. Government, government may have to generate its own resources. To, but I'll let you hold on on that for a minute because I want to take a quick flight to uh, Parliament uh, because there was a pre-budget discussion this, uh, this morning between the finance minister and members from both sides. Koku Asante is our parliamentary correspondent and he joins us via Zoom. Koku, you will come back. Uh, I was asking, I mean, the rationale behind this meeting, it doesn't happen that often. Kukasanti, if you can unmute. Uh, we, I just want to understand why the finance minister had to meet members from both sides ahead of tomorrow's presentation. Well, I'll tell you what Parliament is trying to do over the last few years has been to try and get buy in from both sides of the House in terms of getting to know what exactly will be in the budget. In fact, as I speak, the House has taken more than an hour suspension for leadership of the House as well as the Speaker of Parliament now meeting the Speaker of uh, the, the Finance Minister. He was on the floor early on. And the understanding I have is that he's currently locked up in the meeting with both leaders on both sides of the House as well as the Speaker of Parliament, to try and get into the details of what is coming tomorrow. Early on, he had already met members of the Finance Committee and some key committees of the House to try and give them a preview of what exactly is coming in the 2024 budget. As we've heard from the minority making these allegations and making this claim, that the Finance Minister will be asking for approval to raise more than $11 billion, close to $12 billion in terms of revenue. Of course, they do not say specifically that the finance minister told them that that would mean an increase in taxes. But their assumption is that if you're going to raise 12 billion, where are you going to get that from? Unless, of course, you are increasing taxes or introducing new, new taxes. And that is the claim they've made. We've tried so hard to get the majority on the finance committee to try and give us an inkling as to what they also had in that meeting. They are not really open to speaking to these claims that have been made by the my, my, my minority. They say they want to wait so the Speaker of Parliament concludes this meeting with the, with, the, with the Speaker. The understanding is that the Finance Minister will come to the floor tomorrow and, of course, brief MPs on what exactly the expectation will be. And so when that happens, we'll all get to know what is happening. But now, Elton, the latest is that the Finance Minister is locked in a meeting with the Speaker of Parliament as well as the leadership on both sides of the House ahead of the presentation tomorrow. Closed-door meeting is taking place. The last time... Such a meeting took place. We were told by the majority leader that some demands were made on the finance minister that delayed even the presentation of the budgets. <laughs> do, do you get a sense that perhaps parliament is, is pushing the finance minister to make some concessions before the presentation tomorrow? Well, also, the understanding is that that has to do with mainly what they will call in parliament housekeeping matters. That has to do with, for instance, MPs common fund, things that come to MPs not necessarily personally, but things that help them in the discharge of their responsibilities. Because, of course, when it comes to broad government policy, it is not within the purview of Parliament to decide for the executive or the finance minister what he should do or what he should introduce and not introduce. And so when it comes to that, the finance minister... Right. I think we've lost Kokua Sante there uh, from Parliament House. We'll reconnect if we're able to establish a very good line to... Parliament. But let me, let's come back to the studio. And uh, Mr. Tepe, you were making a point on, yeah, so on, was, on, on your expectation. Yes, I was, I, was I was talking about looking at our, going through our expenditure to, to conduct a comprehensive review and look at those projects that we can defer so that we reduce expenditure drastically. Another aspect is looking at our tax exemptions. For instance, according to the ESA, we have about 25 billion cities alone that government is losing from tax exemptions. I mean, two organizations, especially the multi organizations. Now, half of this alone is about 12.5 billion, which means that if you want to reduce this, even if you reduce it by 50%, that is even enough for that additional 12 billion, 12 billion that government, is, that government want to raise. 
which means that there are, there are areas that government can look at to close gaps, generate revenue without necessarily increasing new taxes. If you look at the issue we talked about, e-levy, it's unfortunate that I mean, a lot of I mean, uh, engagement was made, a lot of noise was made, but unfortunately, government didn't, didn't I mean, uh, uh, listen to that aspect in the sense that if you look at the introduction of that, Indeed, government is a great opportunity for government to get, get more. But unfortunately, like I said, government is overly ambitious of what they want to do. The e levy isn't isn't it the case that with the e levy, I mean, the opposition to it by the minority made it so unattractive to a lot of people. That's the reason why it is not generating as much as government or the would. No, you see, indeed, the opposition was huge, but it is because of what was happening at the, at the on, on the ground. Mm. Because the people who do or who, who actually patronize Momo, uh, this, in, uh, these electronic transactions. I mean, they are those who are at, the, at that level. And if we are saying that, reduce the rate and make it open so that everybody will, so even if you are sending one city and the rate is low, even if it is 0.5% and everybody is paying, you will generate more money. Look at, look at how it has performed. It, it, it is rather unfortunate that it has performed this way, but I'm hoping that there will be a review so that it will bring in everybody and everyone will embrace it rather than the level where it is now. So I'm, I'm thinking that the tax exemptions, review of government expenditure, how it will, it, will be, it will be very nice for government if they will look at the size of government as well and then at least... The tax exemptions the, yesterday, the, the Deputy Finance Minister, Abena Ozea Sari, said, I mean, he was responding to demand uh, that's coming from members of the Ghana Medical Association. You know, some time back, they used to enjoy this tax waiver on vehicles they import into the country after every five years, and that was taken away. And they have been insisting that that should be reintroduced. Now, the, fin the Deputy Finance Minister said that Parliament last, uh, last year passed the exemption you know, bill into the law, which means that government will now be open to allow them to enjoy that privilege. So clearly, even though there's been a lot of talks about the government doing away with tax exemption, granted businesses and individuals that are undeserving, it looks like there may be a window for others to still enjoy these tax exemptions. Definitely, it can be 100% exemption. Definitely, others must enjoy. You see, when you are faced with revenue constraint, what you do is to put your budget down and look at your expenditure item line by line and see First of all, where you can cut expenditure mm. before you think of introducing new revenue. Because, you know, any time you introduce revenue, because our tax-to-GDP ratio is very low. The government said it has done so much in terms of cutting down revenue. You see? And I just left with where to cut <laughs> next. <laughs> you, don't, you think that there's still more that government can cut? If you look at where government has cut mm. so far, most of it at the consumption level where government says that, I mean, each person who is paid, I mean, they are reducing their pay by a certain percentage. I saying discretionary, I mean, cost. Those things, of course, discretionary expenditure or even uh, 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 contingency, uh, contingency uh, cost, for instance. Those are areas where, I mean, definitely they are not specifically meant to be spent. So even if you don't even, you are even cutting, it is something that you only, I mean, uh, you can only... I mean, spend when certain critical issues happen. Right. And so it is not something that you have planned against any particular uh, uh, expected cost. So what I'm saying is that look at the ex current expenditure cost in terms of your project, mm. because government has a lot of projects on the table. For instance, Agenda 111. Mm. It is not compulsory that we should go into this project at all costs. We can look at it and reduce it. Look at the areas. For instance, either you say, okay, instead of building new ones, let's look at the existing ones. Either we upgrade or we, 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 we improve the infrastructure. These are areas without hospitals. Yes. These are areas without hospitals at all. These are districts that, 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 that cannot boost off any health facility. That's the reason why government is constructing these hospitals. Yes, I agree. But you see, these places have been there over the years. The people have been living there. They've been going to the existing hospitals. Mm. And so you look at the, look, look at the, the burden it brings onto their purse. Mm. And then that is where you, 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 you think of. You see... Government can't do everything within the four years period. And we don't want a situation whereby you start a project, 
another government comes, and then because of the complexities with the contract, it is left to, I mean, have to, to become a white elephant. So look at the scenario and then see where you can save. And as though if you are building 111 hospitals, and you realize that, well, indeed, the particular community needs hospitals. But if there's a nearby one, and you improve that one, transportation, the transport system is working. Of course, people will be glad to move into that place. Let me, let, let, let me wrap up with you with these two questions. 2024 is an election year. Key. Government wants to be seen to be doing development. People must see evidence of the, 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 the evidence of the existence of a government. And the only way they see it is through the construction of roads, schools, and other facilities. That is an issue that we need to deal with in 2024. Secondly, government obviously will be entering into negotiation with, for example, labor unions on base pay and other conditions that they that they will present because to, election year present opportunity for the labor force to push government to act. Your suggestion as you protect the economy from collapsing and meeting the demands of these identifiable groups. Yes, indeed, we are going to an election year, and government would like to spend more so that government will become more visible to the people. Mm. But you see, the three main I mean, sources of revenue for the government exports, FDI, and then, I mean, international borrowing from the, from the international market. And that, and that we have been shut. Uh, that we have been shut. Export too has gone down. Mm -hmm. FDI too has been Im impacted because of the challenges in the economy. So government has no option. Whether you government likes it or not, revenue will be constrained. Mm -hmm. And so when you are constrained with revenue, what then do you do? Then you look at homegrown policies. That will generate revenue. Or you look at where you will tighten your own belt by cutting down expenditure drastically. Because whether government likes it or not, everybody knows the challenges the economy is facing. And so government can... I mean, think that because it's in an election year, we need to spend for people to know. The people know that there's a problem. So when you come and tell them the truth, that look, because of this problem, we wanted to do this number of rules, but we can't do it. You see, we cannot afford to go back to the, 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 the days of power rationing. Mm. And so critical sectors of the economy, like energy, you can't afford to let it go, to let it be affected, because once energy is affected, you, you are grounding the whole economy to a halt. So what do you do? These are the areas that you channel your effort on, because if the, 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 the power is on. Businesses are running. The, if, 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 if the manufacturing sector is also running, at least it will keep the economy active. But when there's a challenge, then that's, that's why I'm saying that. Look, focus on the current line expenditure. Areas where you can, you can reduce and then, and then shift attention to the critical parts of the mm. economy such that it will keep the economy running. People will, be, people will appreciate it more to go about their daily activities. At least when he goes and he comes and he gets something, mm. it's okay. Then to be there, he can't go, and then he, when, he, when he goes, he can't get anything. So should we prepare ourselves to swallow a bitter pill, or we should start celebrating? Well, we have <laughs> already... They, they, see, the people have already been swallowing the bitter pill. And so <laughs> we've already been swallowing the bitter pill. And so we know what is at stake. Mm -hmm. It is now up to the government to, to prove that, yes, indeed, we are in need together. Okay. And that is, that, is, that is what is so. So government expenditure is the order of the day. Because if you don't spend, you see, government wants to control inflation, for instance. If you look at what is happening now, there is nothing unique that is being done to curtail inflation or depreciation of the currency. Because, you see, you are no more paying interest. And so, of course, your reserves is intact. Because yeah. if, if you are paying interest, that is where the FX demand will be high. Yeah. So if government has, if there's a suspension of interest payment and loan servicing, definitely demand will be low. And when demand is low, what happens? Of course, you don't spend. So if government expenditure too is curtailed, definitely you don't have, I mean, a lot of money in the circulation. So definitely you expect that inflation will, will, will go down. Once the economy begins to bounce back, of course, if today we say we're going to start paying interest, you see the depreciation of the currency running at a different level. Currently, our international reserves is low, but we are okay because the kind of demand that is on it, which will cause us to, to go to ground zero, is not there. And that is a good thing about, that is a good thing because we are spending about 40% of our revenue on interest payment alone. Just imagine, the revenue that you are generating, interest payment alone is taking about 40%. Look at the rest of the economy. Where do you channel money to? And so if you have been shut to the international market, it means that you now focus on your home, your, your uh, uh, in, look at, uh, cocoa inflow comes in around October, September, October. As we speak now, it hasn't. Normally, these are the things that comes in to support the, for, for the currency. 
getting to Christmas, demand is high. Google bought itself is struggling to raise. It's struggling to raise. Know, so get the banks to, to raise to, the needed to raise funding. The needed so even though cocoa, the cocoa board money hasn't come yet, the second tranche hasn't come yet, you mm. see that the currency is still at a certain st stable level because you are not spending. Yeah, and you are not paying the interest that would have required as, that you, as, you pay more dollars. Exactly. So there's nothing unique that is being done. Just that the economy is not expanding as is expected. That is why it is important that government then look at within and what can be done in order to keep the economy. That, and I say it again, is very important to keep the economy active. Right. Other than that, we are in trouble. All right. Let's shift to other matters relating to the economy because, you know, Gav, I told you earlier that the finance minister, among the things that he will be, he will be telling parliament tomorrow is government plans to ensure that inflation is further brought down. Now, today, the Ghana Statistical Service released their figures for the month of uh, October 2023. Now, I know you love your fufu. I'm an Asante, but I've never eaten fufu, so pardon me on that. But I know you love your fufu or banku, especially when you visit your local chop bar. Even at home, many have turned to it because of its low cost. It turns out this insatiable crave for these two foods is putting pressure on the economy. Well, ingredients for these foods were found to have contributed significantly to the list of items that significantly contributed to inflation last month. The year on, uh, inflation for the month of October dropped by 2.9 points to reach 35.2 percent. That's some good news. This is largely attributed to decrease in food inflation. Listen to government statistician Professor Kwabna Enim. Inflation for the month of October 2023 stood at 35.2, which literally means that between October 20. Prices of goods and services went up by 35. This rate of inflation, which signifies the third consecutive drop, slowed down rate of inflation, is 2.9 percentage points lower than the rate that was recorded for September 2023, which had a rate of inflation of 38.1%. We disaggregate this rate of inflation from two perspectives: food and non-food inflation, and produced items and imported. Between food and non-food inflation, food inflation was 44.8% for the month of October 2023, related to 27.7% for non-food inflation for the same time October 2023. The slowdown in food inflation is sharper as it decreased by 4.6% percentage point between September 2023 and October 2023 relative to the 1.6 percentage point drop for non-food inflation as it declined from 29.3 percent to 27.7 percent for the month of October 2023. From a locally produced item and in an imported item perspective, we recorded a 2.6 percentage point drop between inflation for imported items and inflation for locally produced items, with inflation for imported items 37.0 percent and inflation for locally produced items 34.4 percent. On a month-on-month -month basis, monthly rate of inflation for October 2023 stood at 0.6%, indicating that prices of goods and services between September 2023 and October 2023 went up by 0.6%. This indicates a 1.3 percentage percentage point drop between the rate that was recorded in September 2023, 1.96%, relative to 0.6% for October 2023. Well, however, food ingredients were the major contributor to the rise, or better still, the rate of inflation as we have it now. Uh, Isaac Kofi is still with me here in the studio, and uh, we're going to walk through the figures presented by the government's statistician. So, I mean, 35.2, there's a two-point reduction, yeah. but it is still high. Exactly, and people will say, I mean, the figures are not really having any positive correlation with my standard of living mm. because there's a drop all right, but I'm still experiencing very high inflation in terms of the usual things that I purchase. And this is the reason why. When you go to the disaggregated level of the data that the um, government, yes. he gave, you understand why inflation is 35.2%, but probably that is good for the loans and then the T-bills and all of those things. But you, the common person there who buys your usual toothpaste, rice, candles, sanitary pad, some of these things are still very high. And because the Ghana Saska Service lists 20 items that they call is good for 
further and better policy consideration. All of these items recorded inflation rates above 50%. Some of them even recorded as high as 91.2%. Let me go through them. Mm -hmm. An item like tea bags. Tea bags, so the way that we consume. Yeah, every morning. Exactly. The tea that you, you drink. Exactly. Inflation is 35.2%. That's the overall. But tea bags inflation is 91.2%. So it means that the price between last year, October, and this year, October, has gone up by 91.2%. Does it also suggest that people are buying more of that? It, you can't really tell, but what we, we know is that the price level has gone up, and the amount you needed to buy that same quantity in 2022, you need, to, you need more now, or your purchasing power has now reduced. If you look at an item like country milk, I don't know the last time you saw country milk, but it's become very, very scarce, and the inflation is 72.1%. Carrot, 71.3%. Dog meat, so high. If I so among the top 10. Exactly. <laughs> We've been counting for like eight or six consecutive months yes. that dog meat is actually featuring in the inflation items. It's around 67.5%. And last month, I was there in the, in the hall, and I asked the government statistician, why do we keep having dog meat on the, on the item? He says, well, it's, it's, it's more, it's part of the top 20 items, but it's predominantly in the northern part of the country, probably upper west, sorry, upper east, where you have the market there. And that's where some of these, um, you know, uh, inflation is coming from. Then we have hydrated salts. Salt. All of these things are things that we use at home. Share butter. All of them have an inflation rate above 60%. Non-alcoholic champagne. Herrings. Amane. It's one of the highest. And in fact, if I say highest, I'm talking about the weight to inflation. 2.9%. And its inflation is around 61.6%. Toothpaste has gone up 60.2%. There's local rice at 60.2%. Fresh fish. 59.9%. Uh, uh, There's ready-made clothing, which we call the... the Renewal. <laughs> Renewal <laughs> food. Also up by 58.1% uh, L10. Mm. There's condo, which we used to prepare banku. our banku. Also up. Featuring for the first time, I think, in the top 20 items, 57. There's cassava, fresh cassava. And there's what our, you know, ladies use, the sanitary pad, still maintaining its position on the top 20 items with an inflation rate of 56.3%. Tomatoes, also around 53.6%. Fruit juice, tilapia, and purchase of new bags. So these are food, of these. clearly food, things that you can do away with. Exactly. Things that you need on a daily exactly. basis. Even if, you, even if you take the food items out, there are fast-moving consumer goods mm -hmm. that people patronize every single day. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that is, you know, fueling exactly. the rise in inflation. Exactly. So if you, if you want to prepare your usual jollof rice, you should know that some of these things have of gone up. Your inflation, you need you need to pay more banku mm. because condo is there, fresh tomatoes is there. If you need to eat it with amane, it's also there. If you calculate all of this, it means now if you are a wife or if you are a mother and you are preparing banku or jollof rice or fried rice or even rice with stew, you need to spend more. So that's why possibly the inflation is thirty five point two percent, but at home or in your own pocket, or when you go to the markets, you are not really feeling that prices have actually dropped. Dr. So, Sopre, so government will look at this and say that clearly we are doing something right. That is how come there's been a, a consistent decline in the rate of inflation. They'll be right in saying that, wouldn't they? Of course. I mean, so far as it is going down, they will say they'll be right. Because from 54.1% in December... And now at 35.2, that's about 19% drop. So definitely, I mean, if it is bad and you are blaming them, then definitely if it is falling, you have to say that, yes, indeed, something is, something is being done. But you see, one of the things that we also have to look at is that we have to look at the expenditure pattern. If you look at it, as much as disposable income has not increased, as is expected, mm. when spending is low, definitely you expect some of these things to, to also happen. And so if, 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 if you look at it, for instance, food inflation, I mean, uh, locally produced goods and also imported inflation, these were the key drivers of the inflation in the past mm. years. And so when they are dropping, you expect it from also dropping. But you see, if you look at the basket of computation, it has, it has been expanded now. 
And so definitely once you see in more of these things coming in, of course, the weight is also, is also, also impacting the weight as well. But indeed, we expect that it will go down further. The reason is that expenditure is no more as expected. So if you go to the market today and somebody goes and buy a, a basket of tomatoes, today he goes and says he want to buy the small, the small one. So people are not buying the volume that they are expected. So if you, if Spending you, power is low it's for a lot low. of people. So if you speak to most of, I mean, uh, 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 distributors or, 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 or businesses or those who are into supply of goods, they will tell you that volumes are low. Mm. So people wish to buy more, but volumes are low. Why? Because spending power has gone down. And that is also one of the reasons why uh, this is happening. And so we hope that as it drops, it will help, I mean, people... The, the economy generally. Okay. Let me bring in uh, the president of the uh, Peasant Farmers Association, Dr. Charles Nyaba, because they, 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 they monitor this space a lot. We, we don't have him yet. We'll, we'll, we'll bring him on, and then we'll find out from him what they make of the, the, the rates as presented by the government statistician. But again, so, uh, I mean, Kofi, so how do we sustain this to bring it down even further? Well, this is good news in the sense that once you have inflation rates coming down, just like Mr. Tepe talked about, that's when you can start even thinking about bringing down the cost of borrowing and then also amongst other things. And even if you look at the policy rates, which is currently above 35 percent if you look at all of 30 percent if you look at all of those things then it tells you that going forward government now has that you know breathing space mm -hmm. to actually run some of its policies and programs now inflation of 35 percent is important because you started the year from 54 point somewhere around 54.4 percent and you were hoping that by the end of this year, you should end inflation about, uh, I think, 31%. Government was hoping to do 18, a little above 18%. They realized it was overly ambitious, mm -hmm. so they revised it to 31%. And if you look at the trend so far, I, I have the strong conviction that government could meet this 31 point, I think, 4%. By the end of the, the year. year. By the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's good because having to reduce from more than 50 so now 35 percent, those who, you know, go to the banks to get funding and then also um, loans will start breathing because you will not go to the bank. Those who have loans and then the rates are varying, they will not tell you that because the rate has gone up plus other factors, they are going to increase it. So it's good news on the other side for those at the technical side. But if you look at the disaggregated level and you look at the ordinary Ghanaian's life, this 35.2% possibly does not really... But Christmas is just around the corner where yeah. people spend a lot. Do you see that having impacts on, on, on the rate well, up or down? It's, it's good news because, one, we've not seen the dollar moving, you know, like skyrocketing like we saw last year, you know, uh, uh, 2022, where the dollar can just move from 12 CDs, then you see that 13 CDs, very discreet movement. But this time around, it's been very, very stable, possibly because government has that free fiscal space where we are not doing interest payment, and possibly in the domestic space too, we've suspended some of the principal payments for some time. And so once you don't have the dollar or the city depreciating, it means that business people or importers can now plan properly and bring in goods and may not have the prices to go up. Their import bills will not have to go up for them to transfer to the ordinary Ghanaian. And so if you compare this year to last year, I think that it's been fairly good. If you compare the two, this year has been better than last year in terms of the depreciation of the city and the fact that going into Christmas, we've had inflation moving south. Is this sustainable? Well, it's, 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 it's very much sustainable. I mean, so far as it is affecting other aspect of the economy. So, for instance, the government of uh, Bank of Ghana want to, I mean, tame um, interest, by, I mean, inflation by increasing interest, interest costs. Of course, the investor is looking at, it's still high in the sense that, I mean, inflation is at 35. Um, interest, for instance, um, currently um, is around 35, also around yeah. there about, because Ghana reference, which is a base rate for computing interest, is 32% currently. And so, what is happening is that 
businesses, because they are not making a lot of throughput or volume, mm. they are depending more on loans in running their business as working capital. And so when your interest is also high, and then it means that the rate at which you, it takes you to repay your loan, the, 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 your working capital cycle is now longer because well, it takes you longer time to turn around your, your, funds, your funds than I mean, what you are spending. As for me, inflation is, 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 a, is a poor man's tax. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. you look at, you look, of course, I mean, you it be look, the biggest tax component. Kofi, absolutely. You look at your salary, maybe a year ago, your salary was equivalent of what, $1,000. Yeah. Now you look at it and it's like half of it. Yeah. And then inflation is virtually eating it's more of it away. tax. Exactly. Yeah. But let me bring in Mr. Charles Naba. He is the president of the Peasant Farmers Association uh, to pick his talks on what we are discussing this afternoon. They watch this space. And what, Mr. Charles Naba, you're welcome to the pause here on Joy News. And... Uh, 35.2, that should be a welcome news for you and your association. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me say good evening to uh, uh, the panelists. Um, I said this some months ago uh, that this is expected, but it might not be sustainable. I say this because if you look at uh, our records, the kind of inflation that we've been experiencing is both uh, demand pool and cost pool inflation. Last year, this time, we were recording inflation of 40.5% thereabout. Uh, it was at the same time that the then Minister of Food and Agriculture was everywhere placing planting for food and jobs. And the inflation was caused by food, or it was led by food inflation. And at the time, the main cause of that inflation was that cost of inputs were so high, cost of equipment were so high, the uh, the planting for food and jobs uh, policy one had failed at the time because um, fertilizer importers failed to deliver fertilizer, seed importers failed to deliver seed, yet there were reports that were generated by the ministry and taking money from uh, uh, Ministry of Finance. But if you look at this year, even though government have not invested a peso on the farmer because uh, the planting for food and just two that came into being is yet to be implemented. So we bought fertilizer seeds and then uh, farm mechanization at uh, a full cost. But we knew very well that government support was not coming, so we were prepared for it. So I said earlier on that the planning for food and job phase one was a failure because even with the planning for food and job phase one, last year this time around, poultry farmers were complaining of a limited supply of maize, lack of soya beans, and then the entire markets in Ghana, there was shortage of the various food items. But usually around this time around, many farmers who have been harvesting, you travel across uh, Upper East, uh, Northern, Upper West, Middle Belt, that the Kiman area, come to the Southern Belt and water region. Everywhere, people are harvesting their greens, their vegetables, and then their legumes. So the current drop in the prices of food items, especially the locally produced food, is expected. Uh, other factor that I may want to attribute it to could also be the recent stability in the currency and then the fuel prices. That could also be a factor. So if we are able to hold these factors for a while, maybe we may see stability for some time. But if those factors lose, and then we mop up the surpluses that we are harvesting now, uh, getting to December, if we don't take time, we may see prices of food items going up again. Mr. Nyaba, I'm asking whether... Your last comments has anything to do with the fact that we are almost entering the festive season? Yeah, we do. Because this is the bumper season. When you travel across all the farming communities in Ghana, you see that they are harvesting. Uh, you go to northern part of the country, just like I said, people have harvested their granite. Uh, others have harvested their maize. Those who do local rice, they are harvesting. They are actually looking for market, and they are not getting you come to the middle belt, the fair season harvesting is completed and they are looking for market. And the minor season harvesting has also started. The water region, unfortunately, 
because of the split, it has affected the harvest. But this is also the time that most of them are harvesting. So if prices are down now, it is expected because this is the bumper season. But the point I'm making is that if we are not able to uh, maybe store what is currently in the market that farmers are looking for uh, market and they are not getting, uh, getting to the lane season or even in December, we might see some of the prices starting to shoot up again. Mm. So that is my observation and the experience that I can say over years what the price dynamics are when it comes to uh, October, November, December to January. But the bigger conversation here, uh, how to sustain the gains that we have so far and how to even make life better for the farmer, I'm sure that you will also be monitoring the budget tomorrow. And I just want to find out your expectation because from what we are being told by sources at the finance ministry, it will, it will be quite heavy on the phase two of the planting for food and jobs. What exactly do you expect that government to do to make the program even more profitable uh, and, uh, and then more productive as well? Yeah, in fact, farmers have high expectations for planting for food and jobs. If you are following the conversation in the media space and even talking to farmers across the country, they are all calm because when the new minister introduced this policy, we were, we all were coming because of the loopholes in the, pro, uh, the previous uh, program. And uh, we actually gave him time. Uh, nobody criticized him, uh, tried to uh, cooperate with him for successful implementation. So we are hoping that substantial part of the budget will actually be located to support the implementation of the phase two, which is a private sector led or private sector driven because of the previous experience of inefficiency in implementing the phase one. So one major area I would like to see in the budget is how much budget allocation is going to support the aggregators who are the center of the phase two or PFG. Two, uh, irrigation is an issue. We all saw what happened in the Volta region. We expect to see substantial allocation of resources to address the needs of the farmers around that areas. Already we've been told about, a, them, about some $40 million that the World Bank advanced to Ghana. The Minister for Agri made mention that, that the entire sum will go to help those in the agriculture sector, especially in the regions affected by the flooding or the spillage of the Consumbo Dam. So that has been, that already has been done, or that promise has already been made. You expect to hear more from the, in the budget? Yeah, we expect to hear more, and we also expect to get details of how that fund is going to be disbursed. Because our previous experience that we always hear announcement of certain funds allocated to situations like this, but by the end of the day, reports are written and nothing reaches the farmer. So farmers are still uh, 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 very, very um, um, uh, apprehensive. They don't really know whether these uh, funds will reach them or not. So far, we are only hearing from the media. We are yet to be consulted to tell us where these funds are going, what kind of investment is going to make on them, or is going to be in a form of subsidy mechanization. We are yet to hear that. But so apart input, from that, I was asking whether you, you whether you had the opportunity to input into the the budget preparation. Yeah, to be very honest with you, I think uh, we had the opportunity two times. We had the opportunity of meeting the Minister of Finance himself and his team. Um, um, and um, um, in fact, uh, our inputs that we made, they were they were happy. Mm. Uh, we were engaged one on one to see how we can help agriculture to lead the sector development. So we are very hopeful that uh, given our inputs that we did, we did together with Guta actually, oh. those inputs that we did will be will, will reflect in the budget and it will change the face of agriculture. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Charles Nyaba is the president of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Uh, let's conclude the, the discussion on the budget with Mr. Peter Pepe. Mr. Peter, let me ask of your final expectation as we take leave of us. I'm just hoping that government will bring out policies that will expand the tax base. That is my major concern, looking at revenue at the port. Revenue has gone down drastically at the port because of the numerous taxes that have been introduced. But there's one thing I want to add up also on the agriculture aspect because of the contribution of agriculture to the, our GDP. 
the planting for food and job is one of the best, I mean, policies of this government. Unfortunately, the rollout or the implementation has not helped out. Instead of leaving it into the, in the hands of the farmers, I think that government should create a special purpose vehicle whereby you make the farmers like a shareholder, like shareholders, so that you go in there, whatever land they have, if you have a land, instead of you being allowed to, I mean, plant or, um, or, or, or how do you call it, be in charge, government rather take your, take your land, I mean, provide the needed seed, and then grow it so that after the harvest, then you are rather, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, 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 giving, I mean, what, what is due you. Okay. The first two, they said at the launch was that all you need is just provide the land. All you need is to have a land. We'll give you all the inputs, and then you go into plantation. So that is my challenge. If you say you give them the input, they go into plantation. Again, that is another issue because if you leave it into, in their hands, of course, they, that's why we're having so many post-harvest losses. Instead of leaving it in their hands, rather take charge, create a special purpose vehicle and monitor it, provide the seedlings. You should be the one in charge so that the yield will be more. When the yield is more, if they are, I mean, the farmer benefits, of course, that is good. But if at the end of the day you leave it in the hands of the farmer, he's not able to manage the way it's expected because most of them are peasant farmers in the way. Oh. And you know the challenge that we have. Financing is a major challenge. Other than that, a lot of money will be pumped into it, but we will not, have the, will not, will not be uh, uh, having the uh, needed uh, support. Like how food inflation over the years has contributed to one of the major reasons why we have high level of inflation. Right. Meanwhile, we have plenty for food and jobs. We could have been the best, I mean, policy to, I mean, uh, tame inflation for us. All right. Thank you very much, uh, policy analyst, Mr. P Peter Tepe. And then all of us, we have a date with the finance minister tomorrow. And I'm sure that when the presentation is that they will have more time to now go into the presentation itself, digest the matters, and then look forward to 2024, whether government will be able to achieve the targets that it was set for itself tomorrow. I want to thank you very much for coming on the post today. So, folks, uh, we are still on the post here on Joy News. We're going to take a short break. When we return, remember, last month, South Africa won for the second time the Rugby World Cup in France. And, you know, rugby is not so popular in Ghana. But globally, it is the second most popular sport I, I, apart from football. Now, the organization of the World Cup brought to France 2.3 billion euros. Ghana did not participate. But the Ghanaian won. And I'm talking about the president of Rugby Africa, Herbert Mensah, who will join us to tell us how his presidency will help advance the game of rugby and also influence policy direction in this country. We shall be back. Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile! <sighs> Is the money too small? A bad stomach ruins your day. Don't let it. Take Gastron, your most effective antacid, for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer, heartburn, gas pain, flatulence, and indigestion. Hey guys, what are you waiting for? Let's go, let's go. Mwah. Can you bring down that smile more? <laughs> Gastro, effective relief from stomach discomfort. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been written and approved by the FDA.
Introducing the Kensington Heights at Airport City Kumasi, the largest modern smart city in West Africa. The Kensington Heights is your bridge to the skies where you can access direct flights to international destinations, including the USA, UK and Europe. Imagine a world where convenience, comfort and investment opportunities converge seamlessly. The Kensington Heights offers an incredible opportunity for families, investors and businesses worldwide. Enjoy spacious and beautifully designed luxury suites, executive suites, one-bedroom apartments and two- and three-bedroom penthouses, complete with world-class amenities and easy access to the new Kumasi International Airport. All units are on sale now, starting at $69,950. Be a part of the future of Kumasi and reserve your property today. For more information, visit our website www.thekensingtingheights.com or www.airportcitykumasi. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana in 2016 pledged to ensure free senior high school education for every Ghanaian child. Under the leadership of the President and the Sector Minister, Honorable Dr. Yao Ose Enushum, the first year enrollment has risen from 308,000 in 2016 to over 500,000 students being enrolled each year under the policy, making over 1.6 million children enrolled under the policy as of 2022. The Transformation Agenda Series on Education exposes you to the varied and various achievements of government in the area of education, delving into the policies, interventions, and infrastructure development that has occurred under the leadership of the president. Be my guest this and every Tuesday as we bring you documentaries from across the 16 regions of Ghana on Joy News between 6.30 p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m. Transformation Agenda Series on Education, Reimagining Education for National Development. to be inspired and uplifted when we take you on a captivating journey to the heart of Ghana on the flip side of the Living Standard Series, where we focus on the struggles of everyday people battered by the economic crisis. Now we focus on the stories of hope. We delve into the lives of average Ghanaians and businesses fearlessly taking on the challenges of a tough economy with determination. I believe things will get better. That's why I'm not giving up. Life it's a battle. So when life strikes you down, you don't remain there. You rise up, you fight back. From bustling markets to vibrant neighborhoods, witness the unbreakable spirit of the Ghanaian as they try to build a better future for themselves and their families. Get ready to cheer on these incredible people who prove that in the face of adversity, life shines brighter every day. Stories of Hope, the Living Standard Series. This and every Tuesday on Joy News, Joy 99.7 FM, and across our social media platforms. Welcome back to the pause here on Joy News. Let's do some stories of hope because Mansura Tijani Umar, after a second degree in finance, was unable to secure a job after nine years of searching. But she has not lost hope as she doubles as a mobile money vendor and a fashion design apprentice to gain sustainable income. Her efforts have been supported with financial help from the MBA Youth Empowerment Center. Nani Aljima met with her and has come to with this report. The search for jobs can be a daunting endeavor for many young graduates. After acquiring a second degree in finance nine years ago, Mansura Tijani Uma searched for a job in futility. I completed 2014. I applied looking for a job here and there. So I keep applying. Even some people will bring 10,000, bring 15,000. It gets to a point, I even had an appointment letter, which is a fake appointment letter. So I said, no, I have to just put a stop to all this and go into what I really want to. So I didn't decide to 
go into the story and environment and then forget about everything. And as I'm talking now, even if I get a job, I don't think I will accept it. A 2017 data from the Institute of Statistics, Social and Economic Research at the University of Ghana showed only 10% of graduates find jobs after the first year of completing school. The research further revealed it can take up to 10 years for a large number of them to secure employment. Ghana Statistical Service report for the third quarter of 2022 pegs unemployment at 1.7 million in the three quarters of the year. Spared by the statistics, Mansura forfeited her search for a white-collar job to start a mobile money business. Though the business could help her cater for the family, she believes a career in fashion is more sustainable. Since my infant, I have the passion to learn how to sew because before I grew up, I was with my auntie and she is the master. So anytime I return from school, I'm in the shop. So I was just thinking of what she's doing. I was learning small, small. But then because of school, I paused and then I went to school. But then after school, I realized that no, this is what I want to do because I really want to learn how to sew. So as I was in school, normally vacation, I go out, sell some things. So when I get some small capital, I went and bought small machine. Then I started small, small. Mansura is presently in her second month of apprenticeship at Beth Mark Clothing. Co-founder Rahel Konedu Ado rates her apprentice. She's very hardworking. When you give her something, she's always passionate to get to the perfection. I don't know, maybe she's learning it from us because we always make sure that the work you do has to be perfect. So she's learning that from us. With speed, she's improving on it. Mrs. Ado, a co-founder of Beth Mark Clothing, shares in Mansoura's employment drought. She had to quit her IT job to train as an apprentice in fashion designing. She had it tough, but counts it a blessing. I was working at an IT firm. I had to quit and then come home, sit my parents down and tell them that this is what I want to do. It's not all the family members who agree, especially fathers. They think they've wasted money on you, but to me it's not a waste of money. So I had to sit them down and tell them my dream. And then this is what I want to do. Then they agreed and supported me through putting me into the trade, my transportation in and out. Family helped them. In a year, the apprentice, Mansura, is hoping to be fully ready to operate as a fashion designer. Well, before I even started, I have a shop. I was running this mobile money business and then selling some materials and other stuff. But so I said, no, when I'm done with this sewing, I'll just go to my, my shop and then continue with my work. And then, and as I'm talking now, the one who takes care of my shop, she's a JHS graduate. So she even told her mother, and the mother said, oh, fine. If I'm done, then the, lady, the girl will come learn how to sew for me and then it will really help a lot. Nine years ago, if I had started this long time by now, I'm, I, will not, I will have not been here. Yes. So for me, when you finish senior high or second and or university, when you are done, don't just sit and then oh, I'm looking for, I'm applying for a job. You can do be doing that at the same time, learning a school. For Joy News, Nana Ochima Kumasi. Back here in the studio, we're going to talk about housing because the Joy News Ego One Habitat Fair is coming your way pretty soon. And today, we, we're going to spend some time with some of the sponsors for the event. They're going to tell us about their products and why you should patronize them. So, Ebenezer Chung Berima is the marketing coordinator for Synthes Containers uh, and, of course, Aaron Lamte, Cities and Habitat uh, Project Officer. They are here with me in the studio. And we're going to talk about housing. So, let me start with you, Ebenezer. Yeah. So, I mean, a few days away, and we're going to have that big day. I mean, Syntex, what are you offering? So, Syntex Tank, you know, um, we have been in existence for quite some time now, mm. about 25 years now, mm. and then we are the leading manufacturer in, pl in plastics, and then we provide water solutions to, you know, all water problems we have in Ghana. 
So we have a variety of products to offer, actually. And then we have uh, the tanks. You know, we have different sizes. Let mm. me start from there. From 100 liters to 25,000 liters. And then we're the first to introduce the double layer. We're the first to introduce the whitener layer. Mm. We're the first to introduce triple layer. And then the only company that does that uh, lockable tanks in Ghana. Mm. Yeah, and then we provide the seven years on our product. Yeah, and aside the tanks, you know, people think we're only dealing in the tanks. We have other things we're dealing in. Yeah, we're dealing in other plastics like the plastic pallets. We have the uh, wheel bins. We have utility drums. We have the courier boxes. We have the road barriers. We have the cones. There are quite a lot of them. Aside that, we're also dealing in uh, bottle cup preforms. And then we also have the packaging and lamination side. So it's a whole wide range of products that we have to, you know, offer our viewers and our cherished customers who are going to come on that day to pass to our stand and stand and then get to see what you have to offer them. I mean, it, it's very important, uh, especially yeah. water, where parts of Accra, Ghana Water Company is not able to supply on a daily basis. So you need a storage facility exactly. to make sure that you are... You are always uh, so. Let's talk about the quality of the water that is stored in there. Okay. How long and how usable there is. So the, the issue has to do with the fact that the materials we use for our products, we use uh, hundred percent uh, virgin plastic materials, and then we use UV stabilized agents as well. Mm. So it makes our uh, tanks very very durable and they last very long and then make them reliable and you're able to withstand all these weather conditions. So when you keep your water in our tanks. They are very safe, they are very reliable. And because of white nanny, you can be able to easily clean it in case you want to clean your, the tanks, yes. So it's user-friendly and then it's very durable, strong, tough for all weather conditions. So you are safe with us. So let me bring in Aaron. Aaron, the Accra City Extension Project, I'm very interested in that. I'm yeah. hoping maybe one day I can own one. Sure. So how is it going? It's going on very well. I think as we planned it, it's going on steadily. Uh, the layout is becoming visible now on the ground. Those who have visited the site knows that most buildings have come up and then it's ongoing. Those who have also bought lands and want to develop has also gotten their, their um, deed of assignment and also they've been able to start. So we have a number of uh, clients who have bought lands also starting on the site. Since it's a gated community with all the facility. Is a city that is being built. So that is ongoing and very well, I mean, appealing to everyone. I think everyone can come for the years. And when are you expecting people to move in? Currently, we have um, about two or three clients moving in now because of the way we've structured the rent to own concept. So you pay gradually, and when you get to your 30%, you move in and continue paying for the house. So we have three people who have moved in at the moment. And then we're hoping by the close of the year, seven more will add to it. And then next year, we are hoping we can um, graduate it to between, 50, uh, between 20 and um, 50 people moving into the space. So every, all the houses have come up. We have one bedroom, which is off the market now, and about sold out. three of them. Yeah, they, it's currently yeah, sold out. Mm. And then um, people and two of them have moved in. Then we have three bedrooms, semi-detached, also one person have moving. So these are the uh, um, situation on the ground now. With so there's actually a mad rush for yes, those homes. Yes, there is actually because it's a city being built. Right. As I explain every time, so you have everything within the space. You have your market, you have your schools, you have your lorry stations, you have your shops, um, and all those things within one space. Mm. So that if you plan your, you structure your life well. You can just walk within the end. Having a vehicle will be a luxury for you because you just walk to work, walk to church, take your children to school, buy food, I mean, and you exercise within the space. And it's fully secured and well controlled. So how, how easy is it to own such a home? I mean, owning a home it becomes scary for a lot of people. But yeah. how is it when it comes to cities and habitats? Cities and habitats have made it very easy because when we look at the economic situation, everyone is feeling the pinch. And it looks like um, people are scared buying because uh, it is, you have to put money down before you move into the house. That's why you bring in the rent-to-own concept mm. so that you pay it within your strength, your financial strength. Mm. You pay gradually. The maximum number of years is 25 years. So you pay 30% of the cost that has been spread over 25 years. Mm. 
you move into the house and you continue paying. So as you are in it, it's as if you are paying rent. Right. But you are paying to own your home. And after the 25 years, or even when you choose to speed up the, the payment, payment. At it's least, entirely up to you. Yes, and there is even discounts for those, um, those who pay within 10 years have a, a, a discount that they enjoy. Those who pay within 15 years has a discount that they enjoy. And if you pay I'll try too, there is a discount that you enjoy. I'll come back to ask you about, I mean, when there's so much litigation around land, are there new, are there bonuses or are there some kind of incentives you are offering on the day? I'll come to deal with that. Right. But I know that, uh, even, I know that Sintas is always innovating. Yeah. Are there new products that you have on the market? Yeah, sure. So we have introduced the Syntex Pure Gallon Tank, which is measured in gallons. Mm. It's the most affordable tank in, on the market, as I speak to you right now. The most affordable. You know the economic situations in Ghana, you know, there's no much money and then all of that. So it has uh, the same strength with the other tanks, just that it's measured in gallons and then it's very affordable. So we have introduced this into the market. And aside that, we also have a customer spec order, you know, where you have the opportunity to select whichever color you want and then which type of number of layers you want as well. And then if you want us to customize your, your company logo or your name mm. on the tanks, we can do that as well. So these are the stuff we have actually introduced. And then just to add, uh, we are moving to Tema as well. You know, we are opening a new factory in Tema. That's right. a free zone. We want to expand production so, you know, we can continue satisfying our clients and our customers. Over there yes, as well. Exactly, yeah. So, Aaron, what should, uh, I mean, those who want to buy and own home, what should they expect uh, at the fair? Okay, so um, when you come to the fair, we are giving out uh, a discount on the registration fee. We are giving 50% discount. And then we are also running the 1530 promo. The 1530 promo is a, a promo we've given to those who, you know, when you pay 30% of the total cost, you move into the house. Mm. So we are giving 15% discount to those who want to pay their 30% outright so that they can move in faster and then spread the rest over the number of years that they want to do. So those are the promo we are giving. And when you come to the lands also, which we are offering, the lands um, we give out, we sell it on rent to own basis as well. If you pay... Um, outright, uh, and uh, 70 by 100 uh, um, land will give, will give it to you at 53,500. If you pay within a year, we'll give it to you at uh, 63,500. Right. And if you pay within two years, we give to you um, at 73,500. And all this have been spread over monthly installment so that you can pay it with ease. Yes. So that's what we are offering. And, and, and folks, you can only get this from uh, cities and habitat. Yes. I mean, it doesn't get better than this. Sure. Final words to you, uh, Eben. Yeah, so we are expecting each and everyone to come on board um, this week, 23rd, starting from 23rd, to come to our stand. And then uh, we have some you know, amazing discounts for our customers. Right. Who are through. And then uh, Syntex offers but nothing but the best, actually. So you should always remember that Syntex is your one-stop shop for your plastic needs and your water storage needs. So we expect everybody to come through. And then I would want to... Uh, put across our contact details as well. If Please I go ahead. Yeah. So we have about 300 agents uh, across in Ghana. So you call us or WhatsApp us, and then you give you, you tell us uh, your, you tell us your location. We will give you an agent who is very close to you, so that you can make your purchase or whichever inquiries it is, you can make that as well. And then you can also shop online at uh, www.syntexgh.com and our socials is Syntex Ghana. TikTok, Facebook, everywhere, Instagram, so, uh, Syntex Ghana. And then our number is 0244-335168. 0244-335168. Yeah, we are located on the Syntex show. Anyone hey, also want to share some, some contacts? Sure. Okay. Um, if we are also online, newacra.city, www.newacra.city. When you go there, the website gives you the chance to interact with all our client service persons. And then also, you, we are on all the social media pages, um, cities and habitats. And then also when you want to get to us to the phone lines, 055-55-30300, 055-55-30300, or 0577-911-101, 0577-911-101. So these are our contacts. And anyone who wants to join or be within the uh, new acquired city mm. is welcome. So on the 23rd and on the 26th of this month at the Accra International Conference Center, 
is a joy news ecoban habitat fair and i've been speaking to Aaron Lamte, project officer with Cities and Habitat, and of course, even as a Chumberima marketing coordinator with Synthes Containers Limited. And of course, they have so many products that they will be displaying. If you want to enjoy some discount, if you want to own your own home, I mean, the AICC on the, between the 23rd and 26th should be your last stop uh, to have all of these great, you know, deals so that you can own your own home. And of course, if you want to have something to store your water in, it has to be Synthes. I want to thank you very much for coming to and you have a good day. See you on the 23rd sure. at the AICC. I hope I'll be seeing you there too. Of course, I'll I will be there. You. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. right. So this is the pause on Joy News. And we'll be wrapping up soon. But we're going to have... I'm crossing over to a very important personality, the president of the Africa Rugby. Remember that uh, on the 30th of October, the World Rugby Tournament came to a close in France, South Africa, won it for the second time in a row, and they pocketed over 5 million uh, euros. In fact, if you want to put it, he did proper, there's almost 6 million euros. Now, the tournament is have generated over 2.3 billion euros. Now, rugby is considered the second most popular sport after football. Ghana did not participate because Ghana did not qualify to participate in the Rugby World Cup. But the Ghanaian won. A Ghanaian won because a Ghanaian is the president of the Africa Rugby. And through him, uh, uh, you know, South Africa, uh, Spring was won the Rugby World Cup. Herbert Mensah is the president of Rugby Africa. We want to find out how his presidency impact and help grow rugby in Ghana and, of course, expand it uh, uh, in Africa. Is Herbert Mensah, you're welcome to the post here on Join News. Thank you, Alton. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Let me just say... Congratulations. Under your presidency, South Africa retained the Rugby World Cup trophy for the second time. And that, to me, is a plus for your sterling leadership. Well, thank you very much, Elton. I think the Springbok victory is a victory for the whole of Africa. As you can see, I'm wearing my uh, Springbok tie. Yes. Proud. <laughs> and uh, the pin, which is uh, Springbok, uh, this is Rugby Africa on the mm. other side. Um, we are 1.4 billion people, and every day I send them a message to let them know that we were all behind them. Uh, they have achieved something that nobody has achieved before. They've now won the world title four times. And I think for team sports, this is the only team sport that Africa can claim that they are world champions in as a team sport. Mm. So, I mean, let's bring this home. I mean, South Africa, rugby is quite popular in South Africa. It's also very popular. Uh, in, in, in Uganda and few other African countries. Under your leadership first as president of Ghana Rugby, I mean, the, the men's and the women's team participated in tournaments. Some they won. Uh, the recognition was even done by the president of the republic. How are we growing rugby in Ghana? Uh, and how are you using your presidency to help it even more, make it even more popular on the continent? Well, you know, now I'm president for all, not just for, for Ghana, unfortunately. We have laid the foundation. The Ghana ladies are rank number seven, number eight in the whole of Africa, which is an extraordinary achievement. The men are around about number 12. And I think the scope is there. Sports these days is big business, which is the basis upon which I have been elected as president of Rugby Africa. We've had to call for a mindset change that people need to think differently if you're going to actually achieve where you want to go. And Elton, you've known me for many years. It's the same mantra I had at Kumasi Asante Kotoko. And it's the same mantra that I've had within Ghana rugby. Some have understood, a lot have not understood. But you cannot participate in sport these days unless you're a full-time professional. We saw it in France, that the teams that did well have a full program. You see that some countries were receiving as much as 150, 180 million euros a year plus in terms of what was needed to facilitate themselves coming to the very top. Then you have Africa that receives 2.2, 2.3 million for the whole continent of Africa. So we have to change the way that we think. And I think whoever succeeds over me here in Ghana has also got to think that way. It's no longer about training once a week, maybe twice a week, going and playing the game. Sports of all levels, whether you're an Olympian, mm. whether it's even football these days, you have to make sure that your strength and fitness training, the psychological preparation, the nutrition, the Medicare, 
has got to be spot on if you want to compete. Otherwise, you will not be struggling to compete with nations who are not considered good enough. So what I'd hope that we've left is a different mentality to what some have had here past in Ghana and understand that sport is indeed big business. But you, you have lived it. I mean, you played rugby during your days at the Sussex University in the UK. You are now leading it to make it even more popular and more profitable on the continent. Here in Ghana, do you think that uh, in terms of the administrative seriousness that they need to attach to the sport to let it grow, do you see that happening? <laughs> That's an interesting question, Alton. Clearly, a lot of the players in the, in the, in the field are not, are not equipped to take it to where it needs to go, mm. and therefore you need a completely different mindset. People who argue about things that they shouldn't and can understand that sport is a global issue and there's a global standard. <clears throat> Look, I was elected on the basis of changing governments across Africa mm. and also upon the realization that sport is big business which means we are doing it. Countries that were banned, like Morocco, I've removed the ban, uh, subject to an audit. And the audit is very, very thorough. Mm -hmm. Cameroon, we started as well, the same. And I'm taking a different approach to my predecessors to make sure that we're in a position where we try and understand that money's best friend is money. And as one extraordinary leader we had said, money does not like noise and does not like chaos. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it is that we need to get our house in order, create a gold standard set of governance principles, which it is that sponsors and the rest will look at, a gold standard in which it is they understand that there's a right way to do things, and therefore money will therefore embrace and look at. Uh, in the last eight months, we've been very successful. We've signed deals with the Agence Francais Development, who have uh, given Rugby Africa a large sum of money. Last week, I was in Marrakesh, at the invitation of the African Development Bank to talk at the African Investment Forum, and that has opened doors, which we are now getting into. We now have seven or eight countries in Africa in this last eight months who have agreed to co-sponsor some of our competitions with us. So it is changing across the continent, and what we are doing is enabling society, and I hope here in Ghana, for them to also seize the opportunity to say, we now need to move forward and higher. So what are you hoping to do and achieve within the period that you're going to serve as president of Africa Rabi to bring it up to the level where it currently exists in South Africa, for example? Well, uh, we need to change the culture. So um, across Africa, those countries who have not added rugby to the national curriculum as they have done with football, mm. uh, we're slowly persuading some of them to do so. Uh, that is the first and point, first and foremost. Then it is that we are, for the countries who are very, very serious, and there are many who have changed since we've, we've come on board, um, to understand that the level of investment, directly and indirectly, has got to increase. Some countries, companies, and the corporate world are being pushed by governments. Other countries, governments are very keen on the grassroots approach and understanding that the core values that rugby has are greater than that of football, for example. The issues of respect, of solidarity, of teamwork, etc., which are encouraged in young children from the age of four, five, six, uh, makes them better citizens in the country. And therefore, as a sport, they are therefore better prepared. I think that we have got to really embrace the fact that this sport, as you said, was able to raise 2.3, 2.4 billion euros at this uh, World Cup, which took place now. We had the ladies' uh, competition in Madagascar. 15 to 20,000 people are watching ladies' rugby, Madagascar versus Cameroon versus Kenya versus South Africa. And I think that um, it is something that we should embrace. Not everybody can play football. Not everybody can be an athlete. Not everybody can do, do handball. But rugby is one of those sports that if you are tall, you can play. If you are short, you can play. If you are very fat, you can play. If you are very small, you can play. And I think it should be encouraged. And I think if Ghana is ranked seven now, I would like to see a country like Ghana reaching four, five, three ranked in Africa uh, over the next few years under whoever is in charge. And talking about Ghana, I know that even with our modest you know, uh, standard, 
the the men's rugby team won the tournament. I mean, and then the ladies also, despite the limited infrastructure and of course the fact that the rugby is still growing. I know that when you were uh, the president of the Ghana Rugby, you started this uh, pro project where you were you took rugby to the schools to get people interested. I don't know how far that has helped in in you know in in, in, in engineering interest in the sport. Yes, up until two years ago, I think we had uh, covered 10,000 school children, which is very important. I think then there have been disruptions in governments, but it's clearly the potential is there. The potential is there to get back. And you're right, in Kumasi, under the auspices of uh, His Royal Highness of Tumfo, giving us the access to, to tech, we were able to beat all nations, uh, both in men and women, mm. uh, um, some world-ranked nations, and you're right, the year before, the men traveled to Kampala and beat third-ranked team in Africa, Algeria, in an extraordinary match over there. We've had the ladies beating Zambia and Zimbabwe over the period. So the potential is there. And I believe that we have some great athletes. And it is really about being professional. You cannot do sports these days and just train, say, twice a week. You cannot do it if you don't eat the right food. You cannot do it without the right Medicare. This applies to whether you're an Olympian, a footballer, a volleyball player, a handball player, and more so a team like rugby, which is such a beautifully gladiatorial sport, if I can use that, that word. And so I think with the right mindset and the right uh, vision, uh, it should be possible for Ghana to go far. If not, they will drop off the edge. So the next Rugby World Cup is in four years' time. Are you hoping that we'll have more teams uh, rather than South Africa participate. Maybe we may have, have Ghana at the world stage. Is it possible? <laughs> well, I will not be in charge of Ghana, so I don't know. But um, the next World Cup is in Australia. You're right. We just voted because I'm also on the Council for World Rugby, on the board of World Rugby. Mm. And we voted to change the format to from 20 to 24 teams. So there'll be 24 teams uh, competing in Australia. I anticipate that by 2032, the World Cup after... Africa will have three teams. Now we have Namibia, we have South Africa. I think next time it could be Kenya and South Africa. We'll have to see which way it goes in order to reach that, that point. But I think that in the long term, if the school system is improved, like they have in South Africa, they have in Zimbabwe, they have in Kenya, they have in Uganda, they have in Morocco, many, many countries have changed the way that they look at sport. And that's the first thing, first and foremost. Then if you then do, then do that, then it is that you've got the athletes who I believe who can now participate at the, at the very top level. The rules are very complex. The medical side is uh, something that is critical that we look at very, very carefully. Uh, as you can see in the footage you're showing, if it is that a player has a problem with the referee, the respect is there. There's no talking back like in, in football. Exactly. Uh, the standards are, are very high. So I would encourage, if, if it is as a nation, we actually add it to part of the school curriculum and we understand where we're going, then we're going to have some of the best players um, who may have decided to be volleyball players or basketball players or footballers or something else now deciding to play rugby. And Ghana has shown it has the ability to compete with the very best. So there's hope ahead. Very much so. I think, we, look, Elton, we should also thank His Excellency you know, His Excellency has um, action, and the LOC, the ministry, have built a rugby park at uh, uh, at Legon. I think it will be used at the Africa Games next year. Uh, not every country in Africa has a rugby pitch. So mm. for a country that does not play rugby, I think it is, Ghanaians need to be proud that at least we're encouraging more than just football. We're encouraging other sports as well. All right. I, I cannot let you go. I mean, as I'm speaking, to you, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at so many test messages coming through our test console and a lot more is, they are congratulating you on your feet and so f under your leadership south africa retain the world rugby uh you know trophy but they say that i shouldn't let you go without asking you about football your former <laughs> club kumasia sante kosovo is languishing at the bottom of the ghana premier league they could be relegated if 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 the league should end today uh, you've been, you, you have been following Kotoko, even though now 
uh, you have a bigger role as president of Africa Rugby, which makes it global, which, which, which allow you to give that global attention. But you also follow us on Tikotoko. How, how sad are you right now looking at the position of Kotoko on the league table at the, bot, at the very bottom? Yeah, you know, when you, you love a, a club and you love a sport, it will always be in your blood. And um, uh, Kumasi Asante Kotoko has provided me with some of the most beautiful, uh, heartwarming, as well as painful points uh, in my life. So, mm. But one thing I've learned is that after all of these years, Kotoko will always be Kotoko. This situation, I believe that those in charge must have a solution. That's why they've been given custodian ship of the club, and they should bounce out of it. I've always believed that Kotoko is bigger than the domestic league, and I believe that uh, the leadership should really be looking at conquering Africa, not in the position that it is in. So I would hope that it is just a phase that they are going through, and that very soon we can see the way out, as we saw with Arsenal, we've seen with your team, Liverpool, in the past, uh, right. have their downs, and they then come up, and then they do very well. But I think when you have more than 10, 12 million people following a football club, the expectations are very high. And to be too low in the league is not acceptable to the average supporter. I would hope that they they look. I'm sure they must be. Kotoko cannot be running rudderless. I'm sure they must have some plans in place. And as supporters, we have to wait and see if those plans will bring the success of what Kotoko really deserves. And final question will be, tomorrow is a budget presentation on sports. Are you expecting to hear anything? I don't know. I've been out of the country. I, I just landed literally a few hours ago. Uh, I've been out. The World Cup was from September the 8th to now. Uh, before that, uh, I had put together the Olympic qualification series in Harare, which Kenya actually beat the Springboks, South Africa, in the final to go to qualify for the Olympics. I then flew to Tunisia for the women uh, in Monastir, where the South Africans this time beat Kenya in the mm. finals. So I've been a little bit out of touch of what is happening in Ghana, but um, I, I would hope that the mechanisms, let me put it like that, because the global economy is in, in, a, in a difficult place, mm. but you cannot ignore the youth, and sports is what the youth is about. So... I would hope, I'll listen keenly, that there are some mechanisms in place. The Africa Games are taking place next year. The Olympics are taking place next year. You know, there's a lot that is happening in the sporting world, which the ambassadors for Ghana will be those sportsmen when they go onto the field. So right. I would hope that there's something in place. Thank you very much, Mr. Abed Mensah, President of Africa Rugby, and I hope that we'll speak more on the development of rugby in Ghana and, of course, in Africa as well. So, folks, uh, uh, that will be it for today's edition of the polls here on Joy News. And news just in, government has increased the base pay by 23% beginning January 1 to June 30th. Then from July, an additional 2%. That is news just in after meeting between Labour and the Employment Ministry. My name is Elton Brobe. Tomorrow we're going to have a date. We're going to listen to the Finance Minister and we'll have time to digest the matters that will be contained in the 2024 budget. You have a good evening. Business life is up next.